Ah, all right. Welcome to Rebloom Room. And I'm Kat, and I'm speaking today with Anya. And Anya is a doula in Houston, Texas. And she is also the producer of Doing Motherhood podcast. Is that what it's called? Doing Motherhood? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do and what your passions are? Well, my name is Anya. Uh, you can find me online and on social media as Anya Doula. I do work as a doula. I um, also teach high school. So I teach, uh, I'm back in the classroom this bless year. Bless you. <laughs> bless you. I teach high school students who want to become medical professionals. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a really fun time. I have a good time with students. And I'm also working on a docuseries right now called Black Birth Work with a local filmmaker. Her name is Alyssa Rochelle. And um, that project is really near and dear to my heart because we were both very passionate about making sure black families understand what their birth options are mm -hmm. and have an idea, you know, for those who don't have a clue what they're, what they're getting into or what that looks like. Right. Yeah. We just want to, we're creating something that I think will be like a core educational piece for our community. Hmm. Nice. Yes, I have been there and birth is a very confusing process, whether you have labor or you'd have a c-section or it's 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 an overwhelming process and very much so. yeah and <laughs> usually as the birth person you are not the one to be like organized because once the ball starts rolling it's it, there you it's are true. <laughs> it's true and it's so helpful to have someone that just like can if if nothing else just help set up healthy expectations right mm -hmm. like yeah. just to help you get that know what you should be expecting and what looks right and what sounds right mm -hmm. um and then you know we we we're in the midst of a maternal health crisis mm -hmm. across the board for all women in the u.s but black mm -hmm. women are faring the worst in this crisis yeah. and so um I say all the time, every single black woman needs a doula and there is a doula for every single black woman that's out there, you know, so yeah. um, I think we just, we, we need to make sure that happens. Yes. Oh, I would have loved to have a doula. I really would have loved to have one for my non-labor C-section birth experience. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half day ordeal. Oh, yeah. It wasn't exactly an ordeal, but it was it was a long process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that sounds amazing. And I would I'm a little bit obsessed with doulas because they're so necessary. Uh, today, though, I wanted to talk about empty nesting because um, yeah. I think both of us, I'm sort of at the very beginning of ne empty nesting and you're maybe in the thick of it. Um, and you also on your podcast, Doing Motherhood, you do talk about the empty nest process and how you mm -hmm. get them kids launched <laughs> and, and into <laughs> full adulthood. So I, I guess yeah. the process, I think, um, you know, if you are a parent of a younger kid, you think, oh, you know, once they're 18, ba boom, bam, ba dum, boom, I'm done. And you're like, yes. no. the closer you get to it, the, the more you realize, actually, there is a lot that goes into launching a full fledged adult. So, um, yeah. So where, where yeah. are you in the process? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm still in the beginning. Mm. So my, um, I have two sons. My oldest son is 27 years old. So he's been out of the nest for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was still around, right. And a very close, he, we live in Houston. He went to San Antonio for undergrad. He came back to Houston for law school. And then he moved to Alabama where his dad lives and that's where he's practicing law now. And my younger one, who is now 19. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. My youngest one, who's now 19, he just left for college. This He started college this fall. And mm -hmm. so he left, you know, like early summer mm -hmm. to start his process. Um 
But what's interesting is when, so I thought I would start having these emptiness feelings around now, you know, mm-hmm. now that he's at school, but they actually started for me around this time last year. And mm-hmm. it took some months before I realized that's what was going on. I thought I was just like, in the midst of a deep depression and mm. you know all this other I, I just thought it was circumstantial and depression and mm-hmm. all that and then I was talking to my therapist and she said Anya I think you're grieving mm. and I was like why would I be grieving mm. <laughs> you know, I was like grieving what nothing <laughs> nothing has happened mm. and she was like your son is getting ready to leave and that's and I you know and then it was like oh wow yeah. it just didn't occur to me that I would start the process so beforehand. Early. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can see what's coming. You, all of the things, you know, it's like the, you know, all of if they're going to college or if they're thinking about, you know, what next, there's mm-hmm. that process of, oh, wait, <laughs> this is getting real. Like this is, yes. it's not hypothetical. This is actually, we're doing this. Yeah. So, and it's so because you do, like you said earlier, you know, you have this idea. I certainly had the idea like, oh, as soon as these kids are gone, you know, I'm going to hit the streets and live my life. And um, no, it, it really took me by surprise. Mm. Yeah. On your um, podcast, you answered a listener question um, from someone who had, I think they had two kids and they were artists and they were you know, we're like, we, we, we don't want to go to college, but we need some time to really, you know, I don't know, what is it? And something about our creative they, they process. They to find themselves. Something, something about their creative yes. process. Yeah. And then we were like, we don't, you know, we don't need man. We don't, need, we don't need all that responsibility. So they wanted to stay at with mom. They wanted to stay yeah. at home. Um, so there is that there's this there it gets it kind of depends on your kid like some kids like are like 18 I want to go as far away I want to go the other side of the country I want to go but boo boo you know other kids are are like you know what I want to just chill (laughs) like stay home what was what was interesting about that is that the kids want to stay home but she said I've set them up, you know, she's like, they've got college money. I've worked really hard to make sure they can, you know, get out. And Mm -hmm. um, so what I explained was that, you know, maybe there can be a space kind of, I don't remember what I called it, but I think of it as kind of like a holding space to Mm -hmm. give them that time. Um, because you know, artists are artists and they, they do, they need their creative space and they need that freedom and, Mm -hmm. and all of that. So my suggestion was, you know, maybe let them stay home, but their artistry should be able to bring in something, right? Some, a little bit of income. We're not expecting them to pay household bills, but they can put something on the Wi-Fi, put something on Mm -hmm. the cable bill Mm -hmm. or something, um, allow them the time that would have been those college years and Mm. help them start to figure out what that next step looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, But still being that soft place for them to land and be at Mm -hmm. home and um, yeah, just giving them that space to grow into who they are to become. But I do think that there needs to be some, there definitely need to be like boundaries set Mm -hmm. up. Right. And so I was like, you know, age 21, 22, now they have to start looking at where are they going to go? What are they going to do to start living a young adult life where Mm -hmm. they are, they are finding ways to take care of themselves and then still leaving space until the way I see it is if the government now says that our children can be dependents until age 26 because of health insurance and things like that, that even out until there, I think it's important that we leave the door open, right? Or leave it cracked a little bit for them to be able to come home. You know, if anything happens, our economy is not the strongest right now. We don't really know where it's headed in the next few years. And so they may need that soft place to land again. Mm -hmm. But then, but if they come home after age 22, if they need to come back home, they've got to come back home with a game plan. You Mm -hmm. know, something has to be written down. Agreements Mm -hmm. have to be made Mm -hmm. because we do want them to stay, um, 
accountable to themselves really Mm -hmm. yeah 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 um i was just saying on your instagram um you had posted a an interview with barack obama and he was saying that our responsibility as parents is to ensure that our our um, kids are responsible and what did he say oh teach our kids not to need us Mm -hmm. yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, and although I don't know how I feel about that, I'm like they should still need us. <laughs> right? I don't like, know. I still, I still want. You know, I, I think more than anything, I want them to know that I'm always a place that they can come back to. Right? Like they mm-hmm. can always come back home. Mm-hmm. And so if they need me, I'm here. But, um, but how to be self reliant? Mm-hmm. I think that that's what really important and and self-reliant and um I used to say good citizens Mm -hmm. and I and I still think that that's important right that they're that they're good community members to Mm -hmm. whatever community it is that they show up to yeah ethical you know Mm -hmm. contributing something positive yeah dependable yes contributing Mm -hmm. something positive giving back in some way adding um, and leaving places better than they found it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I wonder about the, the tendency of, of parents to hover and worry and be anxious and like, you know, feel like you can pull the puppet strings on the kids and like, you know, um, so I'm just wondering about, yes, you need to do that, do that when they're little, cause they can't survive without that but then you pull back pull back let go of the strings so how do you as a parent learn how to let go of the strings and let let the let the hovering end yeah so you know I don't think my style of parenting has ever been a hover Mm. I've always been um I don't know. I can't remember what the opposite of the, I've been like a free range parent, you Mm. know, I'm the mom that's like, go out and play. And then I'll see you a couple of hours later, maybe, Mm. (laughs) you know? Um, But I think that at least for me, the way that it's worked is I, I kind of just felt where each child is. So my oldest son has always been a little more independent from the beginning right like he taught himself how to read and write on his own (laughs) he's always been that kid um I didn't have to be so super hands-on with him Mm. you know and so I've always just kind of matched what he needs Mm. or let him kind of show me my younger son, when he was younger, he needed a little bit more hand holding. I had to, especially with school, like I had to really be involved with his schooling in the very beginning. And then somewhere around sixth grade, things just kind of clicked for him. And and then he was like his brother, just kind of doing his thing. Um, so I've always followed their cues. Hmm. And so when it comes to, I'll give you an example with my younger son, he, um, I'm about to brag. So he's, he's a soccer player. He's been a soccer player since he was about five years old. And when he was in eighth grade, he was recruited by um, the MLS team in, in Houston, Texas, it's the Houston Dynamo. So he was recruited into their academy Hmm. and until, you know, through that eighth grade year I was very much involved in everything soccer like I was at every game I was the driver but I was I was definitely watching the moves who are the coaches what team does he need to be on I was very involved in his process once he got into high school and was playing with the academy he in he more or less let me know I've got this now, Mm. you know? And so when it came time for him to make decisions, I had to pull myself back a little bit so that, um, so that he can explore that. And I think that that's, what's really important when you talk about like parents figuring out when should we let those strings go? Mm. Um, my thought process at the time was let him make the decisions 
in this small area of his life, right? And Mm -hmm. something that's very important to him. Let him make the decisions because so far he's been making pretty good decisions for himself. And I'm here if it goes wrong. Yeah. While he's home, he's experimenting with what it is to make decisions on his own. And then I think, you know, now that he's in college, I feel really confident in what decisions he's going to make because he's been able to make decisions and some of them were really good and some of them were not so good. And Mm -hmm. so we had to figure out, but he had that practice before he left home. Right. And so while, you know, I'm in my feelings about him being away at college, (laughs) but I feel very confident in who he is, where he is. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, talk. Can you talk about the feelings, the grieving process that you feel like you've been going through? Yes. So, I, I, like I said, it the feelings all started around this time last year because this is when we made the college trip for him to decide if if Denver was where he wanted to be, mm-hmm. and then, but it wasn't until probably January of this year. January or February was when I realized, okay, I'm in a grieving process about this ending. Mm. So much of it was realizing how much of my life has been spent and my energy and my, you know, like my head space has been spent on these boys Mm -hmm. and making sure that they have everything that they need and they get where they're going. And like I said, they've, they've both been pretty independent children but but it's it's everything for me yeah. or had been my whole life and so it was really hard to come to terms with who am i when they're not here yeah because they've been here for so long yeah that's a huge one that's huge you know and it yeah. it, it sort of leaves a vacuum even before they go it's like you can see it like you can see mm-hmm. that space opening up Mm-hmm. Um, do you, ha- do you, I know you have projects going on. Is that kind of part of what, what fills the vacuum for you or you have, I you're think gonna... I started all these projects trying to fill what I saw as the vacuum and then realized very quickly that that was not a good idea mm-hmm. <laughs> because what I was essentially doing was spreading myself so thin when I, when I wasn't at my own full reserves. And mm-hmm. so then I'm trying to be a part of all these projects um, that I don't have the energy or the headspace because I needed to tend to myself. Mm-hmm. And so I, um, I, I'm just now getting back into my projects full time or like, you know, not full time cause I work full time, but um, I had to just drop, things for a while Mm -hmm. and just let myself go through what I'm going through Mm -hmm. and and like I said tend to myself the work that I do as a doula is service work um it's that heartfelt work it's Mm -hmm. the getting in there and in I often describe it as kind of like when I go to be with the family during their birth process I I leave my life behind and I'm a part of that process. Mm-hmm. During this grieving or this, you know, this transition into empty nesting, I realized I don't have the faith to be that for other people because that's what I need for me right now. Mm. And so I really had to spend um, a lot of the spring and the summer just being there for myself and really tending to myself and being tender and, and, you know, learning what it really means to be self-compassionate and, um, yeah, Mm. yeah. Just kind of be my own doula. I wonder if there is such a thing as an empty nest doula, like to help (laughs) parents through the grieving and the letting go and the, I don't know, maybe I need to, Maybe I need to do that. (laughs) Or find one, yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You talked about um, shifting into more of a consultant role. I guess that was something that was on an Oprah show or something where she talked about, um, you know, you sort of offer help when they ask for help as opposed to jumping in all the time. 
Um, yeah, yeah, becoming the consultant parent. Mm-hmm. My um, that was something. It's something that I watched on Oprah when I was young, and it it just kind of always stuck in the back of my mind. And then when my oldest son, when he was in, I think it was probably when he started law school. And I think I was still, you know, anytime he called to tell me about something, I was jumping in with my thoughts and ideas and advice. And one day he finally said to me, that's not what I need from you. Mm. And it took me aback. I, Mm -hmm. you know, I was a little, not really hurt, but I was like, oh, well, okay. And then I remembered that episode of Oprah that I'd watched so long ago Mm -hmm. where she talks about, you know, when our children become young adults and adults, we're not there to be what I call hands-on parenting, right? It's not our job to jump in Mm -hmm. anymore. They're coming to us because we are that safe place for them and that soft space for them. But we need to allow them the space to work those things out on their own. And so now what I try to do is just listen. And before I start to interject or or add my two cents to it, I ask, you know, do you want my advice or am I just listening? Let me know. And then usually he's like, no, I just need you to listen. And then later on, he'll he'll ask for the advice. Mm. (laughs) But it I find that when I take that approach, we have a much better relationship. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you take care of yourself through this process? Like what kinds of things could you recommend to parents going through this process? Like, sure. Uh, So much of it has been, first of all, therapy. (laughs) Therapy is so important. And I have, you know, an established relationship with the therapist. So we've been working together for some time. One of the things that she reminded me is to start thinking about what what was important to me before my children were here, right? What are the things that I like to do before they were here? And so it's the simplest things. I rediscovered Tetris because I used to be a little Tetris master, you know, <laughs> when I was younger. And so I've rediscovered Tetris and I've rediscovered puzzles and I've rediscovered enjoying to go out for a walk just for the sake of walking, not as part mm-hmm. of exercise, not because I have to walk the dog, but because I used to just enjoy taking long walks. And so A lot of it is just that, remembering who I was before my children were here and trying to um, do some of the things that I've done before. And and the rest of it really is what I said earlier, just being here for myself and putting myself first in a way that we really don't do as mothers. Mm. You know, they've always come first since they've been here. I know. Mm -hmm. It's such a strange time. It's such a strange transition to think of this person who used to be like this small (laughs) to be like walking around in the world and like making all kinds of like responsible decisions and yeah it's kind of mind-blowing yeah Mm -hmm. I have to really kind of reconfigure who this person who you are and also who the the child that you birthed or the child that you raised who they are now like it's Mm -hmm. a it's a different they're they're not that baby because I remember it was hard for for especially my mother to like recognize that I am not that baby I'm really not (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) personal but I'll just say I didn't have the model Mm -hmm. of what it looks like like that wasn't an experience I didn't have I didn't leave home in this way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with my own parents Mm -hmm. so I didn't see them go through this emptiness process you Mm -hmm, know I didn't I didn't know what it should look or feel like Mm -hmm. for me yeah I remember my my so my parents um were divorced when I was younger and um I remember when I went off to college my father said you have four years You can do what you want. I will pay for it. As long as it's educational, you uh, you got four years. 
after four years, love you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in part because, um, you know, my grandmother was getting older and she was moving back. She was moving into the house. So it was just, they just had other responsibilities that they knew were coming up. Um, so I was on a timeline and I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Although my mom was always like, come on in, <laughs> baby, <laughs> which was another completely different feel to it. Oh, I was so like, funny. let me fall back into my childhood role. <laughs> <laughs> so that I maybe that makes it less inviting if you like make your child into a child again. I don't know. It depends on the person. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there is that boomerang effect, though, you know, as especially if the as economy is so weird and wonky and, you know, kids will come back, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm, maybe to be sure. expected around this time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And there's also that cultural thing where, I mean, Americans ex are have have expected their kids to just leave the house, whereas in other non-American cultures they're expected to stay into the house in the house until they get married. That is so true. That is so true. You know, what's interesting is, so I grew up in a military family. My dad was in the military and, and so there's a separation that happens, mm. right? I didn't grow up with grandparents and mm. cousins and aunts because we were always traveling and mm. moving abroad. So our family was very much individualized mm -hmm. as just that nuclear family. Mm -hmm. But it was when I, when I got married, my, my ex-husband is from New York city. And so we moved to New York city and that's where I realized one, because there's a great deal of immigrant families that are there and they tend to carry on their traditions, but two, because New York City is such an expensive place, mm -hmm. people usually stay home longer. Yeah. And I remember moving there and what like I had a lot of coworkers. At the time I was in my early to mid twenties. And my peers were still living at home with their parents mm -hmm. where I had, you know, like my husband and I had started our own household mm -hmm. and it was just such a, it, I just remember it being this like very strange. Um, it just took a while for me to wrap my mind around mm -hmm. adults living at home mm -hmm. well into their late twenties and yeah. early thirties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we, I, you know, it's like, isn't that what it just feels like it's a better deal <laughs> i was so jealous i lived in in new york in my early 20s too i was so jealous of those people who were living at their with their parents in their in new york and i mean it took them so much pressure off like you could mm -hmm. do an internship you could do like a little you know a little part-time job and then like do some art and you know and oh. some travel the world <laughs> and yes or even it was and then i had the friends that just you know they worked full-time but then they spent their money on gucci and prada and mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. all or traveling around i mean meanwhile i'm like oh, yes. I'm making the rent making the rent <laughs> Woo. yeah there are yes. there are other ways there are definitely other ways i also like, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm proud of the fact that I was able to do that, right, and maintain and, and create a space for my children to grow up and, mm -hmm. and we were all fine, you know, like, we, we all did fine. We all were well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, when I think about, and so this is the thing now, as the empty nester, now that I'm kind of coming out of that grieving process, and I'm, starting to be excited now about, okay, what is this going to look like? You know, what, mm. what will I do? Um, in my imagination that I'm trying to make come true, I'm about to be this traveling mother and, you know, I want to mm -hmm. go off and explore and have a good time. And what I told my sons is give me 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 is that all <laughs> give, me, give me 10 to 12 years before you have your families and oh okay then I'll, and then my oldest son said you don't have 10 years with me he's 27 he said you don't have 10 years with me oh okay <laughs> I, said, I said okay but give me a few so I can travel 
-hmm. in my imagination, I want to be when they start settling down and starting their families, I I want to be around and I Mm -hmm. want to be a helpful grandparent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I want to be here. But I right now I just want to get out. Yeah. Fly. There's another (laughs) then that nest is really going to be empty. (laughs) Nice. I'm ready to go explore. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds about right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Do you have anything planned? Are you still kind of in the in the figuring it out stage? Still figuring it out. What I've decided, so I I started teaching this school year. Um, so the school year started in August, and I'm giving myself the school year to figure out what's next. Mm-hmm. And so I, the other thing I will say is as a single mother, empty nester, I think that we have to do our diligence in building or at least just being in touch with the community that's around us, you Mm -hmm. know, like knowing who your people are, knowing who your close and trusted people are, because there's um, hmm. a lot of emotions hit me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, there was a long time that I felt very isolated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, single motherhood is, is not, I mean, I didn't choose it either. I'm divorced and I didn't choose it, but here we are. Yeah. It is, it can be, it's like, I have to do everything. I have to do all of it all the time, mm-hmm. all the time. <laughs> and I don't have, I don't have the partner or the life partner right now mm-hmm. to turn to and say, this is how I feel. Yeah. Or, yeah. um, You know, or that we're not, I'm not having this as a shared experience where, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people at least have a partner Mm -hmm. where they can come home at the end of the night and share those thoughts and those feelings. So, yeah, um, yeah, it can be very lonely. It really can. Mm -hmm. It really can be like you're with this young person and they've got their own thing going and you're trying to like have an adult conversation about the day and it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and also because they're having, you know, like they're having their own experience, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't want to mm-hmm. burden my son with no. like yeah. Yeah. poor mom stuff and he's yeah. out there trying to be a, you know, the big man on freshman campus. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. yeah, I think for for especially for the single parents who fought, who are empty nesting, just mm-hmm. really, you know, knowing who your folks are yeah. and and having a designated person that you can that you can say, hey, I really need you mm-hmm. to be here or can I come there or mm-hmm. can I just kind of, you know, vent to you in mm-hmm. this moment? Because it, it's something to go where like, you know, I've been doing soccer mom life and we get home mm-hmm. from work and school and, and we're out running the streets until, mm-hmm. you know, nine o'clock at night to then come home to just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a very daunting experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's hope that you can change that one too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Yep. Single moms need that support community Mm -hmm. support all of it yeah for sure yeah but yes i appreciate having this conversation thank you i do too this is good yeah yeah it's on my mind (laughs) yep i'm 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 in there i'm in it Mm -hmm. yeah Yep. And I'm going to um, make sure that uh, in the description, I'm going to link to your podcast um, and your IG so that folks can follow you and find you and listen to your, to your words as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Thanks for, thanks for joining. Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) So thanks for watching. And um, if you like this conversation, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so you'll know when the next video drops. Thanks so much.